Hi, this is Naomi with Sword and Steel, and today we are going to be learning about shooting. Not with this, with your miniatures on the battlefield. In our first lesson, we learned how to move our models across the battlefield, how to maintain them in a group called a unit, and the various types of moves your models could make during the movement phase. Now that they're in position, it's time to end the movement phase and go on to the next phase, the shooting phase. Remember, each player takes a turn that is carried out in this order. Command phase, movement phase, shooting phase, charge phase, and fight phase. And yes, we are still skipping the command phase for the time being. In the shooting phase, there is a sequence of steps for each unit you'd like to shoot with. First, you select an eligible unit on the battlefield. Next, you select the target of that unit, and then you fire your weapons. And repeat the above until all units that you wish to shoot have done so. Selecting an eligible unit. An eligible unit is one that, generally speaking, is wielding ranged weapons. Is one that hasn't advanced that turn, with the exception of assault weapons, like I mentioned in the first video. And is one that hasn't fallen back that turn either. It is also one in general that isn't in engagement range of any enemy models. However, like the exception for assault weapons and advancing, there are exceptions for shooting while in engagement range. But those are easy to find and straightforward to remember. For example, if your model is wielding a pistol, it can shoot at enemy models within engagement range of its unit, even if you have other friendly units in engagement range of those enemies as well. It cannot shoot at any other enemies, just the ones in engagement range of it. In most cases, you cannot shoot into melee combat at all, whether you're in melee yourself or have allies that are in melee against the opponents you want to target. So pistols are an exception to this rule as well. Another exception to the rules is for monsters and vehicles. They have their own rule called Big Guns Never Tire. With this rule, monsters and vehicles can still shoot while in engagement range of enemy models. But unlike those with pistols, the monsters and vehicles can shoot at other units that are beyond engagement range. As well as those within engagement range, even if there are friendly units also in combat. However, if the monsters or vehicles shoot while they are in engagement range, they have a minus one to hit. Units can still shoot at enemy monsters and vehicles that are in engagement range of friendly models, though again, if they are not shooting with pistols, their weapons are at minus one to hit for those enemy monsters and vehicles. This game is Adeptus Mechanicus versus Necrons. The Admech have an Onager Dune Crawler in engagement range of these Necron Warriors. The Necron Warriors are in engagement range of both the Onager Dune Crawler and this group of Skatari Vanguard. This Onager Dune Crawler is not within engagement range of anyone. Neither is this Necron Lord. The question is, who can shoot at whom? If it's the Admex turn, then the Onager Dune Crawler in engagement range can shoot at the Necron Warriors with all of its weapons at a minus one to hit. That is besides any blast weapons it has. Because no matter what, blast weapons cannot be fired at enemy targets while those targets are in engagement range of friendly units. I personally think some Chaos units should be able to ignore that rule since I have my doubts how much they really care about their allies. But at the moment, no one shoots blast weapons into melee when allies are in that same combat. So if it's Admex's turn, this Onager Doom Crawler can shoot at the Necron Warriors in engagement range with it at a minus one to hit. But it could also shoot at this Necron Overlord at a minus one to hit. It's up for the Admech player to decide who it wants to target. This Onager Dune Crawler, on the other hand, cannot shoot at the Necron Warriors because it has to follow the rule of not shooting into combat when allies are in engagement range of the Warriors. And it itself is not in engagement range, so its big guns never tire rule doesn't come into play. It can, however, shoot at the Necron Overlord. Now, if it were the Necron's player's turn, on the other hand, the Necron warriors in combat could not shoot at all because they are not a vehicle, nor a monster, nor do they wield any pistols. The Overlord, however, could shoot at this on a Gradoon Crawler without penalty, or could shoot at this on a Gradoon Crawler at minus one to hit. But it could not shoot at the Skatari Vanguard, because only vehicles and monsters can be shot at in combat in engagement range of friendly models. After you selected an eligible unit to shoot with, you need to select targets for each of the ranged weapons your unit is wielding 
before you roll any dice to see if you hit. For a target unit to be eligible, at least one enemy model from that target unit must be visible and in range of the shooting unit's weapon. How do you know if the unit is in range? The unit has to be closer or as close to the shooting unit as the shooting unit's weapon range is in inches. For example, with these termagants, their ranged weapon is the flesh borer, which has a range of 18 inches, so they can target the Skitari Vanguard, but the Onoka Doom Crawler is out of their range. Now, what about being visible? There are four types of visibility, each with their own implication. Model visible, unit visible, model fully visible, unit fully visible. If a model is visible, that means that any one or more parts of that model can be seen from the perspective of the observing model. How do you check that? In some cases, it is obvious. In others, you'll want to crouch down to get behind the model and look for yourself what it can see. I also like to use a laser line, this one is from the Army Painter, to check to see if there is a clear line of sight from one model to the other, or a laser pointer, depending on the situation. A unit is visible as long as one of the models in that unit is also visible. A model is fully visible if every part of the model, including its base, can be seen from any part of the observing model without any other models or terrain features blocking the visibility. A unit is fully visible to the observing model if every model in that unit is fully visible, though in this case the observing model can ignore models within that same unit to determine this. So this unit would count as being fully visible to the Onager Dune Crawler, but not to the sulfur hounds, and vice versa. Okay, so let's repeat target selection. For a target unit to be eligible, at least one model in that unit must be visible to the attacking unit and must be within range of the attacking unit's weapons. If a model has more than one ranged weapon, you can choose for each weapon to target a separate enemy unit or just shoot all of its guns at the one enemy unit. You cannot, however, split the attacks of the weapons themselves. Here are the ranged weapons of the Ballistus Dreadnought. It has three weapons, the Ballistus Missile Launcher, where you choose between frag missiles and crack missiles before you roll, the Ballistus Laz Cannon, and the Twin Storm Bolter. So, the Missile Launcher can target enemy A, while the Laz Cannon can target enemy B, and the Twin Storm Bolter can target enemy C, while the Missile and the Laz Cannon can target enemy A, and just the Twin Storm Bolter can target enemy B, and so on. But you cannot split the attacks of these weapons, the number of attacks a weapon has is under the A statistic, and you can see the frag missiles have 2d6 attacks, while each of the others have 2 attacks. 2d6 simply means that when you want to attack with this weapon, you roll 2 six-sided dice, and the result is how many attacks you have for that particular attack. Not only can you split which weapon is attacking what unit though, you can also have each model within a unit shooting at the same or different enemy units. And these five termagants are given the option to shoot at a unit of Skitari Vanguard or an Onager Dune Crawler. You could put some of their flesh boards towards the Vanguard and the rest towards the Onager Dune Crawler if you wish. Okay, so you've chosen a unit to shoot with. You decided on all of their targets. Now it's time to roll your attacks. Remember, at the end of the video, I'll be giving you a mission you can try that will help you use everything you learned in this lesson. And the rules are available to download yourself, which I'll have a link for in the description. And if you had any questions, just leave a comment with your question. Ranged attacks are almost identical to melee attacks, so what you'll learn now will also help you understand attacking in engagement range. Okay, attacks are made in the following sequence. Hit roll, wound roll, allocate attack, saving throw, assign damage. When a model makes an attack, you roll a number of d6s equal to the weapon's attack characteristic. Like I mentioned, the attack's characteristic is under A, and each weapon may have a different number of attacks. Each dice that you roll represents one hit roll. To determine whether your shots hit or not, you have to check the model's ballistic skill with that weapon and compare that number to what you rolled. Results that are equal or higher than the weapon's ballistic skill count as hits. Any results lower than the ballistic skill are fails. An unmodified or natural roll of 6 is a critical hit and is always a success. An unmodified hit roll of 1 always fails. Never can a hit roll be modified by more than plus or minus 1. And by modification I mean heavy weapons, for example, gain a plus 1 to hit if the unit remains stationary that turn. So they're modifying their hit roll 
by one. They cannot further benefit from any other hit modifier because any hit roll cannot be modified more than plus or minus one, so they could be worsened. When you're rolling your hits, make sure your opponent sees your successful hits and remove the fails before you gather those hits and roll those particular dice again. Now you are making your wound rolls to see if those hits were more than just a passing glance. A wound roll compares the strength of the weapon to the toughness of the target. Here is a wound roll table to help you figure out your successes and fails. If the attack strength is twice or more than the toughness, you successfully wound on a roll of two or higher. If the strength is greater than the toughness but less than twice, you wound on a three or better, or three plus as we call it. If the strength equals the toughness, you wound on four plus. If the strength is less than the toughness but more than half, you wound on five plus. And if the strength is half or less than half than the toughness, you wound on six plus. So if we had termagants versus the ballistic dreadnought, which will not look good for the termagants, then the termagants flesh bores would wound the dreadnought on sixes alone while the Dreadnought would wound the Termagants on 3 plus with the Frag Missiles, 2 plus with the Crack Missiles, 2 plus with the Laz Cannon, or 3 plus with the Twin Storm Bolter. With this power discrepancy alone, you may quickly come to realize that it's best to pick and choose the targets of your attacks wisely, but experience will help with that. Once successful wound rolls have been determined, the player controlling the unit being attacked assigns each of those successes to the models of the unit as they choose, but with this restriction. If there is a model in the unit that already has wounds on it, or has already been the target of an attack this turn, that model has to have the attack allocated to it first. Otherwise, any model in the unit can be allocated an attack, regardless of whether the shooting model can see it or not since the attack cared about the unit visibility and not the specific model within it. Once the attack is assigned to a model, that model makes a saving throw, an armor saving throw. Saving throws are rolled by the player owning the attacked models and are determined by the saving throw characteristic on the model's data sheet. A saving throw is a success if the roll is equal to or higher than the saving throw characteristic. Now an unmodified result of one is always a fail and a saving throw can only be improved by one. It can, however, be greatly worsened. The armor penetration of a weapon is added to the saving throw against that weapon, making it harder to succeed. For example, if the target of the ballistic's LAS cannon had a saving throw characteristic of 3+, plus, because of the AP of minus 3 that the LAS cannon has, the target would need a minimum of 6 on the dice instead to succeed since the minus three to the roll would turn any sixes into threes, which is the only number large enough to succeed. That does mean that in some cases, the armor penetration of the weapon will outclass the model saving throw characteristic so much that it becomes pointless to roll. For example, at a minus three AP, termagants would need to roll an eight or better on a six-sided dice. In that case, you can just say, it can't save or it goes through, to signify that there is no point in rolling and to proceed with the assigning of damage. For every failed saving throw, the weapon inflicts damage on the assigned model equal to the weapon's damage characteristic, and one wound is removed from the model for each point of damage inflicted. In many cases, the damage inflicted will be only one, but with nastier guns and weapons, it could be something like d6 plus one, which means you roll a d6 and add one to your result and the sum would equal the damage characteristic for that particular attack. Once a model has zero wounds left, i.e. has lost wounds equaling to the model's wound characteristic, the model is considered destroyed and is removed from play, and any excess damage points from the attack are lost. There is a common second form of saving throw that you'll find as you play called an invulnerable save. An invulnerable save will generally come from an ability you'll find right on the model's data sheet. Like in the case of this Terminator squad, where every model has an invulnerable save of 4 plus. When a model has both a regular saving throw characteristic and an invulnerable save characteristic, the player rolling the saving throw can decide which one to use before rolling. And how would they decide? Invuln saves ignore armor penetration. So, if the units like the Terminators had to face a model like the Tyrannofex with a rupture cannon at an AP of minus 4 for goodness sake, Instead of the Terminators saving on sixes, their invuln save of four allows them to save on fours instead. Now, so far what we have learned is to hit, to wound, to assign the hit, to save, and to inflict damage by one model 
with one weapon upon one unit. Generally speaking, however, things are sped up a little by way of fast rolling. Fast rolling allows models in a unit that are carrying the same weapon to roll all at the same time. As long as their weapon stats are also the same, and the abilities affecting them are the same, and they are targeting the same unit. So, for example, termagants, which come in a unit of 10 at minimum, have their flesh bores. Every termagant that is wielding a flesh bore, which may be all of them, can roll their hits, wounds, and have their attacks saved against all at the same time if they focus the fire on one unit. This saves a significant amount of time. Even if the termagants split their shots at two different units, you can roll for those firing at enemy A simultaneously, and then roll all of those firing at enemy B simultaneously. Now, if someone's hits are random or the damage is random, like a D6 instead of a static 2, then you'll need to roll each of these numbers individually and then proceed as you would normally. All right, before I give your mission for the day, I would like to go over the benefit of cover. In some instances, terrain and other models can get in the way of your desired target, affecting its visibility. How exactly that happens depends on the terrain itself, and I'll get to the specifics of that in a later video. But what it grants is the benefit of cover. When a ranged attack is assigned to a model with the benefit of cover, the saving throws against that attack are at a plus one to the roll. Models with three plus or better saving throw characteristics do not gain this bonus against ranged attacks with an AP of zero, and multiple instances of the benefit of cover are not cumulative. But what this means is that it's beneficial to situate your models in positions where they gain the benefit of cover and you aren't granting the benefit of cover to your opponent's models if possible. All right, that was a lot of information to take in, so let's just give you your mission for the day. Mission two, shooting. Target practice. Set up one, or if you can, two differing units on the edge of your battlefield. If they have models in them with differing weapon types, that's even better. At both opposite corners, set up a training dummy to shoot at. Then put some terrain in the way to block your model's line of sight to the training dummies. Consider each training dummy to have a wounds count of 10, a toughness of 5, and a saving throw characteristic of 4+. Your goal is to shoot those training dummies to bits, paying attention to visibility. If the training dummy is not fully visible to a shooting model, it is considered to have the benefit of cover and gains plus 1 to its saving throw accordingly. Good luck! Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you have a fun time mowing down your opponents on the battlefield. Thanks always to the YouTube subscribers and our patrons. I really appreciate your support and if you had any questions about these tutorials make certain to comment below so I can answer them. Nearly not better.